Uh, welcome everybody to another grand webinar. We are starting a bit of a new format, a new series here. We're going to try to make this about a four episode series and we're essentially going to be using a brand new visualizer file. We've actually kind of stolen the our mind gap file from the ETC folks. And we're going to basically try to talk about or, or actually talk about how we all approach theater show files specifically uh, in, in our practices. So I'm Noah. I work for High End Systems. I do theater, dance. I do live events, clubs, a little bit of a um, little bit of different types of shows. Uh, joining me is also Megan Wilson, who is also a programmer with us at High End Systems, product support specialist. Megan, if you want to introduce yourself, or if you want, to say I mean, anything. you basically just did. Um, but uh, <laughs> well, we're so. recording now, so. Well, okay, so I'm Megan. Um, I do what Noah does, except I mainly do theater programming, actually, out and about in the real world when not taking your phone calls or answering your emails. <laughs> and then we also have Matt Guminski, who's over in New York, good friend of both of ours and an avid hog programmer. Uh, Matt, you want to introduce yourself as well? Yeah, I'm a freelance lighting and production designer. I uh, started in theater, worked into concert touring. Um, still do theater work on you know new build cruise ship projects and corporate events and some tv and film so i kind of run the gambit with uh with hog programming and i also teach hog classes for high-end systems so. so yeah if you're ever up in new york matt's usually going to be the trainer uh for that northeast area at least for for hog stuff um Cool. Any anything you want to say? I do want to say that right now in Austin, which is where me and Megan live, we've got really bad thunderstorms right now. So we hopefully will not lose power. Uh, Megan lost power earlier this morning. So if we do, we're just going to have to adapt and keep moving on. Yeah. Uh, and so we also have lots of animals. Disappear. That's why. Um, <laughs> yes, and please excuse any loud bangs you may hear because the cats get hungry. Yes, we all have animals in our houses, at least me and Megan do. So they can sometimes cause a ruckus. All right, uh, so let's go ahead and switch over. All right. Um, man, how do we start a show? <laughs> I guess the first thing we wanna probably do is patch, right? So uh, I also say that this webinar series is kind of gonna be intended to for the people who kind of already know how hog works, we're not going to be talking so much about like, hey, how do you do these things? We're going to be talking a little bit more on some sort of features that are specific to the, the theater industry specifically, as well as some kind of best practices that we've kind of picked up along the way and uh, you know other whatnot. So we're going to really just start it fresh. We've are, I've already kind of gone in and patched the show just because that does take a little bit of extra time. Uh, but we have already kind of passed the show, and we'll talk about a couple of uh, neat little tricks that involve uh, getting everything started. So uh, the first thing I kind of want to mention is how do you patch fixtures that are in an odd order? Uh, so if you have fixtures that are, you know they're going to be back-to-back, -back, so for example, one is so it's supposed to go to dimmer two and two is supposed to get go to dimmer four and three to five and so on and so forth but they're actually still in order uh, you don't have to patch them one to one one thing that you can do is you can just select them in that order and as long as there's not any gaps in the actual dimmer destination you can do that um I'm trying to remember where i actually did that in this trial i think it's actually on the front lights isn't it one two three four oh no all the way around uh, but basically, can you guys see my screen? You can. Uh, if you want to select fixtures, it's really nice. All you have to do is just add them into your show, and you can click them in the order you need to patch them in. So if you didn't know that you can uh, select them in the specific order, you can uh, do that. So I'm actually going to unpatch, and if I were to repatch these fixtures, I'm going to say one slash one. Oops. Syntax error. Syntax error, one slash one. You're going too fast. Uh, my one slash, I'll use a hoglet. There you go. One slash one. You can see that my patch is now actually in an odd order. So if you said, if you have fixtures and you're trying to patch multiple ranges of, or uh, a long set of fixtures and you know kind of which ones are patched where, but they're not exactly in the right order, you can just simply click on the left hand part of the screen and uh, patch them that way. So I'm actually going to undo 
which is your and really what this is guys by clicking on the left hand side of the screen is you're really just selecting the fixtures so if you just typed in the fixture numbers also in that order just like you would to select the fixtures in the programmer in that order is the exact same thing so patching just occurs just like fanning in the fixture selection order is what we're showing here yeah um something uh if you guys want to take over, you can. Uh, but something that you'll find a lot in the theater world are color scrollers. Uh, you might not find them a whole lot anymore, but they definitely do exist, especially in older theaters, especially like the ones that I work in, uh, in Dallas and in Austin. Uh, so for those of y'all that don't know what a color scroller is, a color scroller is essentially a fixture that you put in front of another light and that fixture has a motor on it that basically scrolls a very, very long strand of gel and then you can get various different colors. Uh, so conventionally in some older uh, programming styles, some people would have to have them as separate channel numbers. So you would have to be like one through 10 for the intensity of the fixture. And then you do like 101 through 110 for the actual color scroller part itself. And the reason why is because they actually got patched in two different locations. So the console does have a kind of a neat little function called uh, multiple patch points. So I'm going to scroll down here. Uh, and I know we've already kind of done this a little bit, uh, but we'll talk about how to do it. Uh, if you do have a fixture that has a DMX control point and one patch point, but it has intensity from another, that's where a scroller dimmer is really handy. So uh, let's actually turn these on to see you guys can kind of see them in practicality. So they're actually side lights in this rig. And what's the way the color scroller works, and there's a little piece of gel in there. You can kind of see it moving on screen as I'm slowly moving my encoder up. Uh, so that's how that uh, color scroller essentially works. Uh, people used to patch them separately, but now you can actually patch them as one unit. They're actually a generic fixture. So I'll actually just add a brand new one. The add fixtures. And if you were just to type in scroller, scroller dimmer, there's already eight. You'll see that's a two channel fixture. I'm just gonna add one more. And uh, whenever you go in to patch the fixture, so you hit the patch at button, you'll notice that for some fixtures that at least have multiple patch points, there's this little patch point button here at the top. So one says fixture and one says intensity. So if this fixture's intensity patch point was in, say, universe one, and we'll just say, just say 500 because I know it's available, that would essentially patch the intensity patch point. And then if you wanted to patch the scroller function of it, hit patch. And then at the patch point, instead of saying intensity, we'll say fixture. And what's nice about this is it could be in a completely different universe. So if this was in, say, universe seven slash 200, which is a random address I'm picking right now, it can be patched there. So now we're able to control two different points in the console essentially by using just one fixture type. I don't have to say, you know, fixture number this plus this fixture number that to control two different fixtures. Um, there's a lot of uh, other fixtures out there other than just generic scrollers that exist. There's some old moving lights that used to that um, operate the same way as well. So that's my little bit of spiel on scrollers. Uh, do y'all want to add anything in? Um, I do actually. So this would, this would apply to a lot of accessories are really popular in theater, I'd say. So what I mean by accessories are like IQs, IQs that you can put onto the fixture. Um, so basically you drop it into a source for accessory slot and now you have a moving mirror on your source for, um, I think there's like automated irises, gobo and gobo rotators as well that you can put into accessories on those type of fixtures. Um, basically giving you a little bit automated feature to a standard or incandescent lamp. Um, a lot of these fixtures get patched essentially how Noah did, how Noah just did with the scroller dimmer. Um, we have a bunch of these fixtures already built in with the fixture window um, where you can say, great, go find the gobo rotator and you can patch them in that way. And you patch them the exact same way with the patch points. Um, and then with that, though, as fi but those are really no meant for standard incandescent fixtures, so fixtures that go from zero to 100%. Um, we are now getting into the day and age of there being LEDs with multi-emitter fixtures, so like your um, 
luster for example where there's eight million different modes and all most of those modes are not one channel modes um so if you want my suggestion with those fixtures um and this comes from not personally doing it but having to walk someone else through it on the as a troubleshooting thing uh, with if you're using like a multi-emitter light so like a luster a color source elation ha everyone has their version of the luster now as well um what you can do is do my favorite thing of dotted user notation where you patch in the standard light so whatever mode that luster is in you patch that in and you have that as a one and then you have your dotted number be actually just the accessory itself so that if you're talking about an iq that's that can be like a two channel pan and tilt mirror so you'd go find the pan and tilt and then that is your dot one on the fixture so when you hit one enter you grab the whole fixture if you just wanted to control pan and tilt you can just hit dot one and you don't have to worry about grabbing the intensity separately um you could take this a different route and go and build the fixture yourself in fixture builder but to me that's a lot more harder than just changing some fixture numbers I mean, honestly, for me, I like the control of just typing in the fixture number and then being able to control the intensity and then hitting pan and tilt and be able to control it. So I don't even I mean, I like using the the multi uh, I don't use the dot notation that you, mm -hmm. I just use the solid number. But I mean, to each their own, you know, however you program. Yeah. And the dotted number would just add that flexibility in for some like if you needed to, then like yeah. you, you could just hit one enter and you grab because how dotted notation works, hit one yeah. enter, you grab all the parts. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it would still be there. You hit intensity and you have your intensity and you have pan and tilt right there, just as you would if it was a standard source for with your IQ on it. No. Um, but yeah, I mean, and you never have to even adjust the dotted number. It just keeps me out of the fixture builder, which is what I like to do the most. <laughs> um. It, and that's what I have for using accessories with lights. Got it. Yeah, there's all kinds of generic fixtures that we've actually been really good on adding. So if you go into the fixture window and under generic, not a lot of people realize this, but there's a lot of just simple named uh, one channel intensity fixtures that exist now, uh, which is kind of nice when you're working in the theater world, because sometimes you have a footlight or sometimes you have a chandelier or a sconce or a work light or a house light. And previously, you know, if you, you would just have to add a bunch of dimmers or a bunch of desk channels. Uh, but now we've actually gone into the fixture schedule and by default, you have a lot of these various different options uh, available to you. Uh, previously, you could have just gone into Fixture Builder and created your own type. That was a lot of work. Um, but now you could, hey, not a whole lot of work, uh, but now you can just simply go in and add the amount of fixtures that you have. So if you didn't know about this, you can just check out our fixture schedule and take a look at some predefined fixtures. I like the fact that we now have house light as a whole yeah. separate fixture personally. I will say my OCD loves this now. <laughs> yes. It Rather, it, it, the output window better. I mean, what I what I used to do is in the notes section. I mean, I'm big on labeling. So what I would do is in the notes section, go in and label it as in the notes section, house lights, whatever. But being able to break it up in the patch window is pretty great. So yeah, yeah. there's a couple. I think uh, footlight is actually there's actually footlights in this visualizer file. There's a ton of fixtures in this file, much more than uh, I think we're used to doing in our previous webinars. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'll have to excuse us if we're kind of forgetting where things are. Uh, but you know, footlights really just kind of handy to have, and they're separated out from uh, the dimmer aggregation. Uh, one question that I get a lot of people that that kind of ask is, they say, "Well, the fixture window it, it doesn't it doesn't sort correctly." So the fixture window actually sorts by default alphabetically. Uh, so if you go in and you're starting to add your fixtures and uh, you know, you're adding them all in and they're not being sorted by the channel. Uh, they're actually sorted by alphabetical. It's really easy to fix that. And I know it's a lot of people kind of uh, uh, prefer it the other way around. But if you look at the top of each aggregation here, there should be like little arrows. And those arrows basically allow you to move an item up or down in the list. It also nice because it changes it on the uh, quick jumps over here. So if you didn't know that, that they are there. Uh, and then what I generally recommend you do once you have them all sort of uh, arranged, I really recommend that you record that as a view. Uh, so there, your view toolbar here is up at the top. 
think I've already recorded as a view in this file, but essentially uh, you can save your arrangements and the order that they are in to a view. So if you ever do mess it up, you can always press that button again and you get them back into numerical order. Oh, actually, I'll, I'll move this over just because I, I like this on the left. So I'll hold record, I'll hit patch, I'll hit enter. And for you, for you guys that are kind of like new, I, I know we don't always have like the veterans in hog that are used to us saying like user number, um, especially if you're coming from like the EOS world. Um, it's really, re EOS refers to a lot of things as channel. So yeah. if you hear us say user number or fixture number, that equates to channel in the EOS world. Um, so instead of like, we'll, we'll say like fixture 101, that's like, usually I'd, if I was like back programming on the EOS, I'd tell the board up, okay, channel 101 at yeah. pool. Um, yeah. Just so that we don't, and that way there's a little bit bridge there. Um, and since I've already interrupted, um, Pat Hayes asks, is there a way to trick the console into thinking there's three patch points available, for example, an IQ with a DMX iris? No, there is yeah. not. Um, <laughs> Unless you built a custom fixture. But, you know. And the console only thinks in two patch points. So you wouldn't really be able to patch three separate parts. Um, but what you can do is kind of what we were suggesting with the dotted user notation to get that like multi emitter light again, um, where again, your source four or your IQ fixture, like whole fixture that you just patched in and then add in that dotted user number for that last one. Um, let's, let's, let's do that. Let's, yeah. let's just go ahead and um, just kind of showcase how that can be done. So I'm going to add a 11th dimmer because I already had 10. And then uh, we're going to do an auto yoke. <laughs> auto -yoke. Uh, so that's I actually gave a number of a thousand and one. That's really easy to remember. So I'll keep it like that. Uh, and then what was the other thing you wanted to do? Uh, um, an IQ and a iris. Yeah. The I space Q. Uh, I dash. I dash Q. There it is. And there should be uh, just a sixteen bit. Not the three channel. The three channel is the one with the. Uh, oh, you're this one. Yeah, the 15 bit's fine. That just means you have fine pan and tilt. So what I would do, this uh, the console went ahead and gave it its own user number. I would actually make it 1001.1 enter. And what that does is it now assigns it as a, as a, as a dotted user number, basically ties it to this original fixture here. And then what was the uh, third fixture that we wanted to add to the same? A DMX iris. I believe yeah, that's just probably going to be under generic somewhere. Yeah, we do have it. It is. Yeah, I was under Roscoe, actually, the, the DMX iris. Do just do one. And same thing. So we'll say 1001 point. Oops. Man, I typed too fast. <laughs> 1001 1001.2. So now that we've added those and we've added in the user numbers, all be 1001. So 1001 is a whole number, 1000.1 and 1000.2. It's not what it is, and we're going to take a look at our programmer. If you say 1001, enter, it actually selects all three of them. Yep. And you can, from your uh, encoder wheels, you can control, say, the pan and tilt and the intensity. And under beam, you'll have iris. And you can basically control all those different fixtures, but with the same sort of control point. So to answer your question, we don't exactly have multiple path points for it to be truly the same fixture, but you can use that dotted user notation uh, to work around that way. Super powerful. I love dotted user notation. It is. If you haven't been able to tell throughout this whole webinar series. Yeah, same. Uh, I, I've been using it for like uh, trees. So I usually have like tree lights for dance shows and you know, four lights per tree, eight trees, either eight or 10 trees. And I usually do a whole number, a, uh, the whole tree itself is going to be the uh, whole number. So it'd be 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, 1.4. 1 and then if I wanted to select, say, you know, just that one tree, it'd be one, two, three, four, five, so on and so forth for each individual tree. And if I wanted to just select, say, the middle light, I would just say, Point two, and it would subtract out from my previous selection, the new selection, essentially. But, you know, to each their own, everybody's brain works a little bit differently. Uh, that's just it's, really very, it's very interesting. It's a very, very interesting way to do it. Mm -hmm. 
I would get very confused. So don't show me your magic sheet. <laughs> <laughs> well, I try. I try to not have like you know channel numbers in the thousands. You know, I I I hate having to type one zero zero one. For example, I I prefer to to try to keep my numbers a little more down. Um, but that's just my preference. It's all good. Cool. Um, All right. Anything else you want to talk about patching before we kind of move on to checking your rig and and can I can we actually do something with the dotted user numbers before we go forward? Sure. So if you turn on the first thing I want to do is turn on highlight and um, select the back. I, I know that I know in the show file we have a group for the back wall. I um, actually deleted it because we were going to talk about how. Oh, okay, auto, great. Auto groups. Um, well, then just select seven hundred one through. And hit highlight. Uh, lots of light. Oh, I think I know exactly what you're. Yes. So in here we have this giant grid in the back, and it's basically the exact same as what we've been playing with with the RGB fixtures in our previous rig. But this is another case where I really like adding in dotted fixture numbers. Um, we're not really dealing with bars at this case, where we actually have individual RGBs that are spaced out. Um, and there are seven going down and so many going across. Um, but what I would do here is in this case, so that I can get everything separated out, I would select them all like Noah did and then press set and actually give them a dotted user number. Um, so where we go and start at 701.1 slash seven. And what that slash is going to do is say, how many times are we going to increment the dot number before we increase the whole number. So now that that's there and they've all gotten their dotted user numbers, we can hit clear. And then if Noah just hit 701 enter, it's going to grab just that first row, that first column there. And then 702 enter, we'll grab the second one. And it will keep going on and my count might have been a little bit off. Yeah, it's off I think by one. Okay, There's an extra well, one in there somewhere. Uh, oh, well. Okay, well, we'll blame the rig. Um, Megan sucks. Argue, ah. <laughs> argue symmetry. No, we didn't put yep. this rig together. Uh, we actually, I really like this rig, uh, but we're still kind of learning how it's all yeah. put together. Um, but yeah, so it would go in that way, um, and you can just keep going. And in theory, if the rig had perfect symmetry, oh, I bet there's a dot eight, actually. I think it's eight down. Now that I'm looking at it better, um, rather than seven down. So no one point one one slash eight slash eight. There you go. Seven oh one enter. And now if we do seven oh two, there you got, go. I did it. Nah, numbers. Um, oh. and now you can actually just quickly and easily grab that whole like bar at a time going down, or even if you selected all the fixtures and you want to go each row, then you can just hit dot one enter and that's going to grab the whole top row dot two enter will grab the whole next row and so on and so on. Um, so your dotted user numbers can, we could either make groups for all of these rows, or if you know your numbers, uh, then you could also just use the dotted numbers like we just did here. Mm -hmm. There's also a really handy shortcut that I just kind of used uh, secretly, and that's uh, holding down fix and pressing next or back. So if I say 701 enter, and that first line is on, if you hold down the fixture button and you press next, it actually goes to the next whole number fixture, but keeps the dotted user numbers, uh, the decimals in place essentially. So now when we got 701.1 through 0.1 through 0.8, then 702.1 through 0.8, and it's a good way to if you just need to find a specific row or a specific column. Uh, what's kind of neat is that if you do, I so say 701.1 plus 0.5, very little high up. It's kind of nice is that it does keep the dotted numbers that you pick. So I picked the first and the fifth dotted number, and I'm able to do that across the board. And that, that goes the same way with compound fixtures. So if you have multi-cell wash lights and you hit a lot of people, they'll select the fixture and highlight it and then try to like update focus groups. But what they're doing is they're actually going through the individual parts of that fixture. So a lot of people forget right. to press and hold fixture and next to move to the next fixture. That's also true. 
And, and anything that I'm throwing out here with dotted user numbers, as Matt just said, I just want to say applies to everything with a dotted user number. So exactly like Matt said with the compound fixture. Um, like I think there's some like col um, Colorado battens or whatever that are patched in as a compound fixture in here. Anything that we just did uh, applies forces. the exact same way. Color forces. It's just the same. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, uh, it's a dotted fixture number. It's the same thing. Mm -hmm. So that gives you, yeah, individual cells as, and then you could do the whole group. Yep. Would y'all look at that? <laughs> Faster yeah, programming. All right. Do um, you want to talk about note groups, Megan? Yeah, we can talk about note groups. I love note groups. So Noah mentioned that we automatically give you fixture aggregation if you, you know, patch the right fixtures. But sometimes you need to be a little bit more specific inside your groups. Um, so inside your fixtures, we have a whole bunch of source for LEDs, um, but those can be used in a bunch of different areas on the stage and maybe some are front light, some are backlight, all that kind of stuff. Um, or some are like front light, you know, closer to you and then front light in the back. Um, sykes are perfect for this where you have tops and then bottoms. Um, so you can actually it, go and give all these notes and the the beauty in giving them all notes is that you can very quickly and easily make groups automatically based on these notes. Um, and so like Noah's already gone through on these color forces here and has given them all a note of psych and then he did a comma and then broken them up into two separate groups. So psych top and then psych bottom or psych low. Um, yeah. And what the comma will do is when we hit uh, or what will happen is when we hit auto fixtures or auto palettes, I'm sorry, auto palettes, um, we will have the option here to make a note group. And it's basically going to make groups based on all the notes that you have here. So whatever fixtures you have on these that have the same notes are going to be placed into those groups. Um, and then when you put a comma, that means we're going to break it down into separate groups. So by having site, comma, site, top, that gives this fixture into both groups at the same time. Yep. So if Noah hits generate, which is kind of off screen right now, um, but I probably it was a little pop up that said, "Hey, what do you want to make a pal What do you want to make a note group?" Was checked. Then he hits generate. Um, I did that. And now, uh, I'm sorry. It's, it's okay. I feel like I did a good description. The other thing is make sure it's in the note group. Like uh, patch note won't yeah. do anything. It's only in the note group. It's only the note column next to your fixture number. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, patch note doesn't really do anything fun, so it's just another place to put notes if you need to. Okay, that's not fair. Patch patch note is good for when you've got a fixture that I usually do it for when the fixture is not doing something it's supposed to. So if I have a fixture that has like a bad gobo wheel, yeah, I'll put a note that says, "Hey, mm -hmm. this has a bad gobo wheel." Or if a, a lamp busted, if I saw a lamp pop, you know, while I'm walking in front of a house or whatever, I'm going, "All right." that one i gotta remember that one doesn't work so that when i'm programming i'm like why is this not working oh that's right i have a, I have a note to, on to be fair though when you unpatch that fixture for any reason the patch note disappears because it's associated that with that patch yes by, by the by the name but so by, just be warned just say some people don't know that yeah. <laughs> no, so as matt said be aware of that um, and when I say it doesn't do anything fun, I literally just mean it liter It doesn't do something like this where we auto-generate and stuff like that. Oh, should we talk about the edit fixture thing really quick? Like the panning and tilting editing if we had another... Is that a thing? Or... Yes, that is let's, a thing. Let's, 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 let me showcase kind of how that note group thing works really yeah. quickly. And then mm -hmm. we'll, I think we'll move into kind of checking fixtures and, you know, how... Yeah, how that we, we have groups to go through. Right. Uh, so like Megan said, uh, we did actually create some uh, groups through the auto group function, which is really nice. And if you look here, uh, it does make them an alphabetical. So you do have to come back and move them around and rearrange them um, as you would see fit. So do kind of keep that in mind. Although what's kind of nice is if you look at the site group, and I'll make give you guys a visualizer again. There we go. Uh, as you look at the site group, which I have selected, it selects both the top sykes and the bottom sykes. I deselect it, and now I have the bottom sykes, psych low, and of course, psych top. Uh, there, and there's some other groups as well that we've made for this rig. Uh, for example, I think there's a group that selects all movers. 
So something that I will do is I'll say, hey, this is a mover, and that selects all movers, but then I can also come back and I can select, say, the down movers or the down wash movers or the front light movers, which you can't see right now, but that's because of their, their positioning currently. There they are. Uh, so just a handy tool if you didn't know it exists. It's really nice to very quickly make groups for you. And it's nice if you add more fixtures and then you add that patch note and regenerate your groups, it'll uh, regenerate and add that information in for you. So cool. So I think that kind of leads into kind of what Matt was talking about, and that's uh, setting fixture defaults and, and checking your fixtures, essentially. Uh, Matt, is there anything you wanted to, to so talk about first before I kind of showcase it or is anything? Oh, I mean, it's just, uh, so uh, there are some fixtures on the market where the like the main example would be like the pan and tilt or offset 90 degrees or, or you know, whatever. So rather than going in, um, if you want your rig to be uniform, you can actually go in in the edit window and, um, you know, you can change that default so that it will pan and tilt in the right direction with the rest of your rig. So there's actually a really handy, uh, this rig is actually done incorrectly on purpose, I think. Yeah. Uh, but if you note the, the down mover wash group, if you tilt it, it starts going over stage left and that's without me adjusting any pan values. Whereas if you move the spots and you tilt it, it goes either upstage or downstage essentially. So, uh, yeah, how can we change that? Because that would drive me insane. I know it would drive you all insane. Yeah. Uh, so let's figure out what fixtures those were. So the fixtures that were uh, 90 degrees offset were the... Uh, oops, I just want to go to the right place. The down river washes, so 121 through 128, right? So what yeah. I like to do is I like to tilt them just a little bit forward and that way they're, you know, I can see what direction they're facing. And then uh, if you go into your fixture window and there's a handy button called edit fixtures and we're going to actually say sort by function here and navigate to the solo washes, which is 121 through uh, 128. And we'll go into the pan range, and we could set the default pan to be 45 degrees off. Uh, the only problem with that is that uh, when you start like putting in fan values and things like that, you're going to have different values. So what I recommend in this case is actually messing with the offset. So I'm going to change that offset to be 45 degrees. Sorry. Uh, 90 degrees. 90. Yep. There you go. The other 45. I had some fixtures the other day that were 35 degrees off for some reason. Little Chinese lights. Yeah. Well, there are some manufacturers out there that it is like I will go in there and it will be like 92 degrees. I'm like, oh man, calibrate properly. <laughs> yeah. I know it's frustrating. Yeah. Uh, so what we've actually done with that offset, we actually just changed the home zero point of the fixture. Didn't change the default, we just changed the home point. So now, hopefully, if we go back here and we select those fixtures and we tilt, oh no. They're oh, actually the other way. They're not all oh. going the same way. Oh no. Let's just do a tilt invert. There's that one right there. I go into the fixture window, we'll go jump our solar washes again. Do, 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 do. There's so many pictures. Right, right under the solar frame 750. It's like one down. All right. And we'll do a tilt and vert. There you go. Now, now they're moving the right way. But now our pan value is messed up. So I'll also come back and do a pan invert. Yep. And now we might really be backwards. <laughs> we will re tilt and vert. We rehearsed this, I promise. There Basically, go. there are a lot of ways to change the default values. Yes. I always, rec I always recommend that you go in and, and really, really check your fixtures before you start really programming. Because if you start doing those inverts and stuff like that, it mm -hmm. can um, you have to kind of go back and re-update some stuff. Yeah. So I also guys, here's another way you could have done it really easily. Is, or not, never mind, I lied. 
Never mind. Don't hear me out. Don't listen to me. <laughs> I also have questions about this lighting rig. I wish they spaced the movers out more. <laughs> you know, you don't always get to choose your choose your rig. Well, when you're the designer, you do. <laughs> um. Yeah. So another thing that I, I try to peg for edit fixtures is it's really good for things like pan and tilt but it's really also handy for uh, focus. So focus in, in hog world is the actual focal point of the lens. I know in other consoles focus is like pan and tilt position, uh, but on our console we call focus the actual focal point that you're um, designing to. So I'd like to do on kind of all of my shows, if I'm doing a concert, I try to focus to the beam as best as I can. But if I'm doing theater, I try to usually have it focus uh, straight to the first gobo wheel. So I'm going to go in and let's go ahead and just add a gobo here. And I'll clear this out. Uh, 121 through at full. And uh, we'll go ahead and add a, oops, wrong fixtures. Still learning this rig. Hey, Paul, what do you mean this works with the replace fixture and patching? Like, will it carry over, like, if you were to change type? Sorry, I just, I, I want to make sure we're answering the right question. He said yes. Um, I believe those settings all say the same if you replace fixture. I don't yeah, I mean, if you clone, whatever the values of the fixture that you're cloning from will go to that next fixture. So you, mm -hmm. there's a chance you would need to go back and set those those offsets back to zero if it's a normal fixture that doesn't have that weird offset. So, yeah, if you're replicating fixtures or, or I mean, or rep changing type, you always want to go and double check and make sure it's right whether or not these fi these carry over. Yeah. Um, especially because you never know if you're dealing with like a rented fixture, whether or not for some, like the defaults weren't cleared and they had pan inverted on the fixture itself. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just a really good time. Like if you're doing your fit when you do your fixture check. So part of like my fixture check when I start the whenever I start the rig and for the first time is to go through each light light, make sure tilt is going the way that I want it to go. When I do the encoder wheel, make sure pan is going the way that I want to go. And when you change fixtures, you also want to do that fixture check again yeah. before you start messing with your offsets and your defaults. Because, I mean, there's not a you might you might save yourself some time if you do it first, uh, just so that you can get that in the proper setting that you need to. Like when I do when I do touring, like non theater related touring, but concert touring, like I will have a brand A fixture that I program my rig with, but I will go into a venue that has a wash fixture that is another manufacturer and their defaults are 90 degrees on the pan. So when I clone that fixture and I go into my focuses, all my lights, like my downstage, like straight washes, they're all actually pointing stage left because the defaults for that fixture that way. So I just go in, I'll change the offset and they'll all go to the right position. Hopefully that answers your question. <laughs> so uh, kind of coming back to the edit fixtures thing, as I was kind of setting this up while we all were talking, uh, another common thing that I will do is, is set the default focus to a focal point. So I actually went to the programmer here and I found that about 92% of focus is actually pretty sharp to the gobo. I will actually go into the uh, edit fixtures window and set that as my default focus. It'll just help me a lot um, along the line. Other, as well as with like wash fixtures, usually I'm just gonna do a wide wash. Uh, so either 75 or 100% zoom. And so I'll set that as the default zoom value. So that way, whenever I turn my fixtures on, they're already kind of where I need them to be. That's a neat trick. I've never thought about doing that. What? I just use the defaults. You just use I, the default like 50%? Yeah. I mean, I, I like, because the other thing is when I'm working with moving lights, I feel like, especially when, I pro when I'm programming my own stuff, I feel like when you start playing with the focus and the zoom, you get some really cool optics. So 
rather than defaulting to just a hard edged gobo like sometimes you can get some really great texture looks and you discover n different things when you start layering gobos on top of each other like maybe you've accidentally tracked a focus through but it makes this really good texture really good movement yeah i just stick with the defaults i play with my fixtures all the time though yeah i i also am one that usually sticks with my defaults um i'll go and adjust like the pan and tilt stuff to make sure you know yeah. when i tilt up stage it tilts up stage like yeah, yeah, yeah it does the right thing and i you yeah and i go for the encoder wheel i don't go for the trackball because i don't ever use the trackball for pan and tilt because it will throw me off yeah. um i will put it in though for zoom or focus whatever i decide to put that scroll ring in for um but the um, so I'll make sure that goes the same, but I'm the same as Matt. I don't go and fiddle with like the gobos and stuff like that. I'd rather spend the time to make palettes. So where I have a gobo wheel one focus palette, a gobo wheel two focus palette. That way, if, if the, and again, I'm not usually designing my programming. I'm usually implementing someone else's design. So I am, I, I like being the programmer strictly. Mm -hmm. Um, so if they say, Hey, can you just put in gobo the star gobo in the hard focus? Like I can just tap the palette and it goes. Um, but if it is like, hey, can you go play with this a little bit? Then I can the defaults allow me give me more mental capacity to actually go and play with it. I think. I also have discovered that uh, when I'm programming a theater show now, I don't really do beam palettes for gobos anymore. Like I just use the slotted toolbar to select. And, but when I do concert touring stuff that I'm going through and I'm cloning rigs on a daily basis because um, I'm using different house rigs, I will use beam palettes for gobos because it just makes my day a little bit shorter. But when it's the same rig, you know, I'll just use the slotted toolbar. My beam stuff will be like my iris and my focus and and my zoom rather than like filling it up with gobos. Right. So. Yeah. And I'll just have the two focus palettes like or yeah. different pal that, that just push me into a hard focus. Or if I pick up on the fact that the designer keeps throwing us into a 45 degree focus or 45 percent focus, I'll toss that into a palette. Also, yeah. like at the end, like it, usually my palettes get into whatever, especially because the media picker is and slot is a lot more useful to me than the beam directory. Totally, totally, yeah, agreed. So I kind of want to talk about a, a a little bit of a hidden feature of the console, just because you kind of brought this up, Megan, how you don't really like to use the the trackball all that often, and, and everybody has their their preferences. I mean, I like the encoder wheel method, of course. Uh, but there is a little bit of a kind of hidden option in your preferences under trackball where you can essentially uh, change when you're in trackball mode. There's a thing called ortho toggle. Uh, so what that does, and I don't know if Matt, if you even knew about this, uh, but it basically if you uh, start in one direction, it will only do that axis. So if, if you're using a trackball and you're going up, but you're kind of drifting a little bit to the left or a little bit to the right, it's not going to adjust your pan value. It's only going to adjust your tilt value as the sort of direction that you started with. And then vice versa, where if you start left and you go a little bit up or a little bit down, it's only gonna pan, it's not gonna tilt. So if you're looking for like a little bit cleaner control, um, I personally, when I do have a trackball, I will almost always have that ortho mode uh, enabled in my preferences just so that I can use it for that functionality and I'm not, um, you know, having to get really kind of odd looking values. I'll be honest, I just don't like using the trackball to control pan and tilt, even with that mode turned on. It's just a lot, See, but, I, I just process and I, and a lot I like more in the two pan and in the two, with the two encoder wheels. See, this is something that I love is, I, I love that Noah and Megan and I have three completely different ways of doing things. Like I'm with Megan on, I do not like using the trackball for that stuff. I mean, I have it set up to be able to to use it if I have to, but I never really use it. But Noah uses it, so. No, I, I will it. use the trackball if I'm doing like large throws and it's like two degrees of pan doesn't do anything. So then the trackball will roughly put me there, but that's not usually theater programming. That's usually some kind of architectural yeah. programming. I literally will sit there with the pan and the tilt with both of my hands and be doing it that way to, just because the way my brain thinks, I can just lock it in really quick. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, we've all had our muscle memory built in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, cool. So we like to focus. Um, Noah, you want to talk about modes and our wonderful different modes on fixtures? 
Yeah, I, this is kind of a uh, this is a note that we had that we kind of wanted to talk about. Uh, but check your fixture modes very carefully whenever you're starting your show, because nowadays with everything being so digital, it's not hard for a fixture manufacturer to have 15 different modes for a single fixture. Uh, so definitely make sure that if you're going into a show that the the modes that say that they're going to be on the on the paperwork match the mode that is in your console, which is also matching the mode that the on-site technicians or the installers actually put it in. Uh, where a, a classic example, and I know me and Megan, we get calls about this all of the time, is uh, with ETC fixtures specifically. Uh, they're very flexible in all the different modes and the different markets that they can appeal to. Uh, I will say that if you're ever on HOG, I will almost always recommend that you actually run in uh, what's called RGB mode. And the reason for that is because of the way that HOG handles color. It just handles color in a three-point system versus a multi-point system like the ETC console does. So just kind of keep that in mind that if you're going into a venue and you're going to be working with some uh, fixtures that do more than just uh, RGB, see if they have an RGB mode and use that with the console. Um, you can also check what uh, the uh, parameters are. So if you're familiar with DMX charts, uh, you really want to, as far as preparation that goes, uh, make sure that the uh, console has the same DMX values as a DMX chart, at least just at, on a very rough perspective. So the way that you can essentially do that is with the fixture builder window. So if you go into fixture builder and you copy a fixture type, and I'm just going to copy something that's built into the desk. I'll just copy one of our Soul Frame 750s. And if you want to check that you have the right mode uh, and the right DMX values, that can be done in the fixture builder window. It'll tell you exactly what is on what channel and what those values are. Uh, you can go into the advanced tab and look at more specific values if you need to. And don't forget, like, if you don't want to go into the fixture builder, your, like, your fixture schedule, when you hit add fixtures, it's going to show you how many DMX foot, like, the DMX footprint, so how many DMX channels each fixture that you're going to schedule adds uh, is going to take up. And that's just really helpful to on a quick glance of, like, hey, I need, I know that the luster, the mode that I need has six channels. Well, let's go figure out which one has six channels. Okay, this is the mode that I need. Um, and that's just, again, really useful to know. So when you patch, like you're getting that right that right mode. It's a it, and it, it might save going into the fix. Again, I'm all about not going into the fixture builder. Yeah, um, so I mean, it saves it, not going into it if <laughs> if you know that the DMX channels. But there are some. So like well, right reason, here with the luster that has eight different modes and one's five, six, and seven. The issue, <laughs> the issue well, I have is with with like the luster profile. And we've talked about this before. It, you know, it's saying color one, color two, color three. It's just, you know, I would go in and try to, you know, if I were to build my profile for it, I'd make it like, you know, this is the lime green. This is the blah, blah, blah. It's, you know, yeah, something we so, need to work. So the reason that I personally will recommend fixture builder is because there's fixtures that have multiple like six channel modes, right? And so they, there might be a few that say, oh, this is six or, oh, this is 15 channels. And so that's why I personally, if you don't know which one's which, that I would just say go in a fixture builder at that point. But Megan, you are right. You know, you can use the channel count. Uh, I just, I know that with the way the fixtures are nowadays, there's so many different versions out there that it's, it's pretty easy to uh, uh, patch the wrong fixture now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just because there's a plethora. We have 17,000 fixture profiles in our desk right now. That's insane. <laughs> and most of them are just different modes, I'm yeah. sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know how many fixtures that is, but I know that we have 17,000 individual profiles. Uh, it could be more. I, I haven't looked at it in a couple months. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, and just, like, so just be aware of what modes you're putting it in. Be aware of what mode the console really likes. So kind of reiterating what Noah said, um, the Lester's, like anything with multi emitters, like you probably want to put them in some kind of RGB mode. That way that you can utilize the color picker on the console. And I, I know with lusters and like this was before ETC acquired us, like they have that compute. They do the ETC does the binning to make sure and the spe the smarts that are inside the fixture that when you dial up red, you're going to get the best combo out of those emitters to get the best red. 
Um, so that's also another reason. Why, the best red, according to the computer, red, I should say. Um, that is why also I also say let the fi the fixture work in the six channel mode or in the RGB mode because it can do the smarts that you isn't easily done on the hog color picker. I don't use the color picker. There you go. There's another way that I I'm don't. Very I mean, I I'm like my whole thing is I operate in CMY because I'm old school. I'm or I learned. Uh, with color mixing as opposed to, you know, subtractive color mixing as opposed to additive, which is what LEDs are. Also, I find that if you're using intensity red, intensity green, intensity blue, you will start to get yourself into some trouble in terms of presetting your colors, which is a very theater thing to do. Whereas in rock and roll, it's a little bit more forgiving. So if you were to use your CMY, um, which the the media picker really doesn't follow i think its default is the intensity rgb correct the color picker is hue saturation and hue hue saturation. yeah hue saturation and intensity okay yeah, yeah yeah um and that goes into another thing with with the hog which hopefully one day that will get fixed is that if you op are operating in cmy to hsi there are some like color drops and weird pops and stuff like that but uh, I stick with one, build my color palettes, and, you know, mm. go that way. That's fair. I, I just do everything in the color picker and then dial in the extra color emitters as needed. Like, if I have an amber or a white and I don't like what's happening, then I can go in and adjust those and add those in. But I also, I think that just comes from the cross compatibility of HSI and taking that yeah. to other things that are not just COG programming or yeah. console programming. I do a lot of, like, web development and getting the colors right, I can just stick in that HSI space rather than having to keep switching what mode my brain wants to think in. Yeah. I don't think I've ever opened that window, Noah. <laughs> um, I, I like it for the, for the fanning reasons. It's just it's easier, to, it's easier to fan than in CMY, and that's just, that's just a personal thing. Fan, get... fan in, in hue and saturation, you mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think you can, get, you can get some more specifics um, out of the two. Or sorry, I think you get something very specific out of CMY. But I, I just, I, I'll, I'll, I'll say this: if if you're programming on the desk, pick a color mode and stick to it. Yep, that's 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 my advice. I think we all when this is what happens when we get a third person in here. We all we all have different opinions on like this is how I like to do this. Before we get too okay. far away from modes, um, is there, a Tim is asking, is there a value in picking a mode with the largest number of parameters so you can change type to a different mode with fewer parameters? I'm going to let y'all answer this. Uh, I mean, for, are, are you, uh, is there a value in picking a mode with the largest number of parameters? I mean, you can always scale down, you know what I mean? Like you can't scale up. Uh, so, I mean, if you're referring to like patching, like your, your patch footprint in terms of parameters on a fixture, I'll always go to max because, uh, you know, the higher parameter count, you'll get, you know, your fine pan, your fine tilt, your fine gobo roll, you'll, you'll get more options. Um, and it gives you the option to, you know, if for some reason you need to scale down cause you're swapping out a fixture type or whatever, um, you, you know, you're able to scale down, but you can't go back up within fitting in that DMX footprint. I mean, that's my opinion. I mean, I, I think you should have the most, as long as your console supports it, you should try to do the highest mode possible. Mm -hmm. uh, but you don't want to uh, get yourself into a situation where you're like out of channels. Because if you add something in later, you know, you, you do want to have a little bit of buffer space. Uh, and it's much easier to go from from a patching perspective, it's much easier to go from a high channel count to a lower channel count because you know you don't have to uh, move your your patch around essentially. So I would always just say go in the highest mode possible, unless that highest mode is a mode that has features that are completely different than what you want, right? Um, I know the TV world. There's a lot of TV fixtures that they have different modes. And different modes have some 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 modes have this feature and some modes have that feature. So just make sure that you're actually truly using the mode that fits the feature that you want. Yeah, the other thing is with like washes, there are certain washes that have zones and stuff like that. And sometimes for me, I just want to wash as a wash. 
So I'll actually just dumb it down and say, I just need the entire, the entire faceplate to light up a certain color. So I don't, you know, I don't waste channel counts there. Right. Yeah. I mean, if you're using a, a wash fixture as a house light, you know, you don't need that individual zone control, save, save your addresses. If, if you're running low. Mm -hmm. Um, that kind of wraps it up. I will say that, you know, this video, we really wanted to focus on how do you kind of get started from a patching perspective. I know in the next video, we're going to focus more on how do you program and how do you create some palettes that are specific to theater. So that's kind of why we're kind of staying in this kind of theoretical space of, well, how do you like to do this? And then like, do you have like, anything else you want to add or, um, no, I, th I think it makes more sense whenever we're talking about programming the next thing I want to talk about. Yeah. Yeah. We're gonna, we're gonna Thanks. All put it together. So as a user, in the next video, we're going to talk about highlight and low light palettes and why you would want custom palettes um, for those and not just the default of what the console gives you. And the console doesn't actually give you a low light palette. So why would you want one? Um, and then like Noah said, more programming and stuff like that. So now we are open for Q and a type session. Um, feel free to ask about anything, anything that you saw here or you want us to go into more de in depth. I'm sure we could all argue over which color space is better if that was interesting <laughs> to you. Um, I'm sure we could argue about which way the pan and tilt should go um, or this, it's not the discussion y'all want. It's not arguing. That's true. <laughs> Discussing, I should say. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, Anthony has a, a good question, and hey, look at that, it's about color. Uh, he says, when working in HSI, how do you avoid hue and saturation fade issues? Oh, so, easy. Uh, there's, there's two ways that I can, can look at this, and I see y'all both smiling get, and, and all giddy. Uh, so the first thing is, are you translating from a different color model into hue sat. So if you're going from cyan magenta yellow to hue and saturation, you're going you're gonna basically at one point kind of skip over and as you're crossfading up saturation, you're gonna go through white essentially. So to get around that, I would say don't use CMY in the previous queue uh, or just, you know, just once again, stick to a color system and keep it that way. Uh, another thing, that you can maybe consider is changing up your fade and your delay time for each parameter. So uh, in your programmer, make sure that you guys can see, oops, I have- So this is basically discrete timings. Ba yeah. Basically, that's kind of what I'm gonna go with here. Uh, so if I said 701 to enter, and I'm just gonna pick a, pick a color, the default fade time is two seconds and the default delay time is zero seconds. So it'll happen instantaneous. Uh, what you can do, so if you are going through white and you're not doing like coming from CMY or going from one point to another, uh, you could possibly uh, set your fade time on saturation to be like zero, but then your hue time could be two, three, four or five seconds. So that if you don't wanna see that kind of white shift, you can do that. Uh, so it just, it just kind of depends on where your previous data is coming from. Hopefully, hopefully that answers your question. Do y'all do y'all have anything to chime into that? Isn't there another trick where you dial like saturation to a hundred percent or something like that and track it through? I heard I heard something. I mean, I can't really speak to the hue set because I don't really use it that much. But you could do that. You could also keep in mind that there's path. So uh, oh right, uh, path. There's so the the default path for color is going to be a linear but you can go in and you can change it to be like a start path or an end path or uh, and, over, under, random. So there's different like transitions that you can take essentially. Uh, you actually it. might get some really cool looks, transitional looks by doing that too. Mm -hmm. Like I think okay. over, over does some really cool stuff or random, I think there's one that's random that'll kind of do, 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 do. Yeah, so I just did an over an, an underpath or an underpath. <laughs> uh, I'll do switch this to over. Uh, so we'll do over. And what's kind of nice is I'm blue right now, and if I go to red, you'll see I go past red into yellow back to red. So you can kind of use your your path direction essentially to get you to uh, some different functions. And let's just let's just see what um, shake shake's one of my favorites. So we'll go from red to blue and it's really like, it's shaky. It's actually bouncing kind of 
it, it eventually gets to the endpoint, but it kind of bounces around between the two. Um, so you can kind of use that for uh, your color values as you're transitioning. And this also works in CMY and other color models. Not, I like the shake in fixed gobo wheel uh, kind of transitions when you when you go from one gobo to another gobo on the same wheel. The shake actually does these really cool bounce effects. It's pretty rad. Those paths are like uh, are like a a little a secret treasure trove of really cool transitions that not a lot of people use. So yeah. right, yeah, and if and if you have a mover that supports uh, gobo, uh, you know, it's not just gobo slots; it's actually a gobo uh, plus or minus values. Then you can crossfade a gobo from gobo one to gobo three, for example, <laughs> instead of you just getting that snap. Because mm -hmm. the default path for gobo is actually start; it just jumps right to the end. Uh, let me see if I can get a visual reference for everybody that uh, is not familiar with path how it works. Um. um. We are not actually allowing this version of Mind the Gap to be downloaded because we had to modify it actually to work better on Hog um, because the original Mind the Gap has the direct values. And as of right now, we we are not sure how we want to distribute this as like a company, like how we want to distribute this file. Um, that way there's not like 8 million versions of Mind the Gap out there. Um, but I believe any some of the ETC tutorials will have the original version of mind the gap which yeah is, and the the lusters are in direct mode right that, that was yeah the, difference. The, the only difference that i changed on this file is i made the lusters be instead of them being direct mode i made them be rgb mode just so we get a little bit better color handling from a hog perspective and i think that was it actually um i don't think i, I don't think we made any other changes <laughs> So you can download this. It's on the ETC's website. Uh, just search for Mind the Gap. Uh, there's not a hog show file currently. Uh, I could probably throw one on the website uh, in the future, probably not for the next couple of weeks, but probably in the future we could get something uploaded. Yeah. Cool. Um, and then I know this, I know it's 12 universes of control. Does it actually split over two DPs? I've been playing with it in beta more than I have normal. Uh, it Sorry. does. The, the way that the patch is on this show file is it does get split over two DPs. So the first DP is only using like the first eight universes, and then all those RGB LEDs are like on four, five, and six of another universe. Yeah, they're on they're on uh, capture, U at least in the capture file that I got, they're on capture universe 20, I think is when they start, so that would be in theory a second DP. Um, you can, but with visualizing, if you're just using CITP, the limit doesn't matter. So you should be able to take that, that visualizer file from ETC's website and change the connectivity options instead of SACN, or I believe it's set to SACN by default, you should be able to change that in the presentation file to CITP, I believe. What are you spelling there? MTG, uh, mind, MTG. The gap, mind the Gap, or Mt Gaminsky. Yeah. Yeah, it's, <laughs> Met, it's Matt Gaminsky, actually. <laughs> it's set my middle name, that's not my middle name. Uh, that would actually be a. I want to pixel map that back wall. That would be for the pixel map. We could. I mean. We could I mean, we can add. We can. Okay. We can I'll actually add do it really quickly. Uh, so oh yeah. Two. I mean, if it's eight by however many. Mm hmm. Um, taking it back a little bit to the path. Sammy did say um, that they use a lot of damped and break paths in theater. And I do as well. That way you don't get the abrupt just stopping at this point so that you get like a little ease in or a little ease out depend for on especially on movements. Like I yep. don't want I usually want those to be a little bit more subtle than in the rock and roll and it doesn't necessarily matter too much type world. Mm -hmm. Um where I usually like try to ease those in a bit more. Yeah, no, it's uh they're great. Mm-hmm. Oh, somebody needs to change their orientation. Dun, dun, dun. Although that was kind of a cool effect. Yeah. Nice. Everyone's looking at us like, how are they pixel mapping so quickly? <laughs> <laughs> so let's see. M. And. There you go. 
That's what I would do when the director walks in. I'd be like, that's my name. <laughs> of course you did. Uh, that's beautiful. Anyways. Um, well, actually, kind of, I think we're going to do that in probably the third ish mm -hmm. video. Uh, we're, the next video is going to be kind of how do you set up palettes and stuff like that. Then we're going to talk about uh, playback. So, what are some different uh, programming syntax involved for programming shows, uh, specifically for theaters? We're going to talk about block cues and how to touch and suck, how to use comment macros to start different chases, and how to create a lot of just uh, more theatrically driven uh, where the design is a little bit more concise essentially yeah. that rock and roll is not concise uh but you know in our theater world we have 20 different reds but in uh rock and roll it's like here's red and here's pink <laughs> i'm saying that sarcastically. i'm saying this sarcastically i'm just putting the caveat out there for everyone listening depending on the show yeah. totally i mean you could be doing spring awakening which is very much a rock and roll which funny story i actually programmed spring awakening on a hog 1000 Ooh. i designed that's going back old school <laughs> uh, i had a professor almost make me use a hog 1000 to control a dl hd and luckily we got our full board just in time <laughs> actually was, that's what it wasn't I slated on anything and it wasn't slated on any shows so i was like yes my uh my first hog experience was a hog 500 in college nice i mm. yeah i i threw i mean i have enjoyed the whole like hog progression from the fact like from the well i started on the hog 2 but hog 2 the 500 and then your three and your four i got to skip a lot of the three though ah uh, well i didn't have those pain points as much as other people did I, I will plead the fifth on that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I don't see any other questions. You yeah. guys are kind of quiet today. Uh, but so feel free to always hit. If you do have questions after this is over, um, feel free. This will go on YouTube within the next couple of weeks. I, we're all on. Um, so just be aware. YouTube will go up when it's able to go up. I usually get it to the video team within the next couple of days, depending on the recording. Um, sometimes it takes a little bit longer to get it uploaded, just depending on like you know schedules and stuff like that. Um, when is the next one? The next co next ones are coming out on Thursdays, just as per usual. We just took a break last Thursday so that we could familiarize ourselves with the rig a little bit and actually decide what figure out the series. Um, but the next three episodes are going to be in the next three Thursdays. Yeah, so Thursday at noon CDT or whatever, however that translates to your time zone. Yep. Ooh. WebEx web I think when you click the link, WebEx should automatically mm -hmm. tell you what depending on what time zone you're in. It should. Yep. Because I get the emails when everyone registers and those ones that come in from Eastern really throw me off sometimes. Because I'm like, did it's I schedule it wrong? It, did I schedule it for the wrong time? Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah, when I drop it into my email, it will change the time on me. So awesome. Yeah. Um, what YouTube channels is going up on? It goes to the ETC study hall channel. I believe we also try to get it onto the high end uh, YouTube channel, but I know for sure it is going to the YouTube. It goes to the ETC study hall channel. Just go hit that subscribe button on the ETC study hall because they have a bunch of other stuff coming up too. Wait, what do they say on YouTube? That's like smash the subscribe button, like <laughs> is that? Hit, the bell to turn, hit the little bell to get notified. I've been watching yeah. YouTube videos. Trust me, I've watched way too much YouTube, yeah. and it's just the nomenclature they use. Mm -hmm. It's like, if you like it, like it. If you don't like it, like it anyway. Smash the <laughs> subscribe button. I'm not a YouTuber, clearly. I'm a designer programmer. <laughs> it's okay. You can paste that into YouTube. At, at anyway. least our videos are not sponsored. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. All right, I'm going to cut the recording.